Thanks for joining us here on Biz Asia. I'm Michael Wong in Beijing. We continue our special coverage of the upcoming third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee. The private sector and fiscal reforms are on the agenda for tonight. First up, Chinese President Xi Jinping has outlined a blueprint for China's future. He stressed the importance of more reforms and promoting innovation while maintaining steady growth. Now, during an inspection toward the China's central Hunan province, Xi Jinping urged governments at all levels to stabilize growth, make structural adjustments, promote reform, and improve people's livelihoods. Xi said China should not simply pursue strong GDP growth, but must focus on transforming its economic model to ensure healthy development. Now, President Xi also reiterated his support for innovation while visiting local companies, saying that fast growth requires optimizing business structure and eliminating excess capacity. He encouraged companies to innovate in technology, management, products, marketing, and branding. President Xi's remarks reaffirms the policy direction of quality growth over speed. Now, China is set to unveil detailed reform plans at the third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee starting on November 9th. So further developing China's private sector is likely to be high on the agenda at the upcoming plenary session. Before we get to those reforms, Jackie is here with a look at policies encouraging the private sector participation from past policies. Hi there, Jackie. What Hi. do we got? Yeah, well, there are two guidances, Mike, that have uh, been released by the Chinese State Council on developing the country's private sector economy. The first ever document on encouraging and establishing China's private sector came out, that was in 2005, and it allowed private investment to enter sensitive areas, such as the military and also national defence. It also opened up state-owned monopolies, such as electric power, oil and gas, telecom and railway construction to private capital. Investment in social welfare was also encouraged. Now, five years later, in 2010, a new regulation expanded the range for private capital investment. Infrastructure, obviously, a major focus in this document, ranging from transport and logistics to new energy and also affordable housing. It also encouraged private capital to enter financial services sector, including private banking. Private investors can even own the business or have a majority stakes in their projects. Those are the documents. There you have it, Mike. All right, and certainly a lot to expect for at this weekend as uh -huh, well. Absolutely. All right, so on top of the government's reform agenda is to open up more state-owned sectors, including finance, telecoms, and the railway industry to more private investment. Our reporter, Guenxin, explored the trend of Internet companies now venturing into the financial sector and con concluded that while the trend of freeing up China's financial market is inevitable, the road might be bumpy. A bold step into the financial sector, hopefully one in the right direction. Several well-known private companies have pushed into the financial industry, a sector long guarded by the state. Attracting savings and loaning to enterprises are no longer a bank specialty. Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent Holdings, and even the electronic appliance retailer Suning are among some of the new players. Our goal is to provide investment service with easy and fast experience. Everyone should be able to invest. Financial products should not be with high threshold and far away from ordinary people. Traditional banks, mostly state-owned ones, however, may view them as a threat. Particularly troubling to state banks is a competitive return that these new players offer on deposits. Just two weeks after its initial launch, Alibaba's online platform had 2.5 million customers transferring around 5.7 billion yuan into the fund. And Baidu received a 1 billion yuan subscription of its fund on the first day. The success hasn't gone unnoticed. Competing directly with state firms, especially with likes Bank of China, one of the big four of the country, seems a daunting task for private firms. Moreover, private internet finance could find itself mired in regulation if it steps too far into the territory. After the intervention of the Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission, Baidu took the 8% guaranteed annual return out from its marketing slogan. Constraints sometimes means opportunities. It's more like an infant. Infant has a lot of constraints, but no one says infant has no future. Everyone believes infant has the best future in the world. That is because they have the best way to be nimble. 
to be fast, to be smart, to learn new things. Despite lacking clear rules, the government still has good reason not to stamp out the green shoots of the industry just yet. China's new leadership has recognized the importance of feeding entrepreneurs and the private sector with credit. A shortfall in that segment of the market birthed a massive shadow banking market four years ago, where capital star businesses survive on high interest loans. Li Zhiguo is venturing into the financial sector and created a financial management application. Recently, the State Council has called for financial innovation and to provide financial services to ordinary Chinese people and small enterprises. I think that shows it's going in a good direction. So we should venture into the field and do some exploration and make adjustments according to the country's regulations and policies. The new trend draws great attention not just for the future of online financing, but for the life of private business in China and the caliber of real reform currently underway. But a foray of internet companies into the financial sector, despite huge risks, is living proof that the opening up of predominantly state-owned industries to private capital is an inevitable trend. Guan Xing, CCTV, Beijing. Now, the third plenum of China's 18th CPC Central Committee will kick off in Beijing this Saturday. It's expected to inaugurate extensive economic reforms. Now, media reports indicate part of those reforms could well be breaking up monopolies in the country's energy sector. Zhang Tao reports. At two petroleum stations in Shanghai, drivers said they routinely choose smaller stations rather than ones run by bigger players, mainly for lower prices. Mr. Lu has been a taxi driver for eight years. For taxis, the cheaper the better. Sometimes Sinopat offers discounts during the evening, but here there are discounts all day long. The price of number 92 fuel at this Dongliang station is 0.3 yuan per liter cheaper than that at the Sinopak station nearby. Sinopak's price is 7.75 yuan per liter. Staff at the station say they usually try to undersell the market, and drivers confirm this. Compared with Sinopak and PetroChina, there are discounts here. China, the world's second largest oil user, already relies on imports for 60 percent of its consumption and is set to double its fuel use by 2030. Right now, large state-owned oil companies still monopolize the sector. It's not easy for smaller private operations to gain market share against the big established companies. In Shanghai, private stations may take up only 5 or 10 percent of the market. It could be more in the suburbs. It's just like a movie. When the seats are full, there's no room for late commerce. China's leading oil and gas producer PetroChina and Asia's largest refiner Sinopak reported last week net profit growth of some 20 percent in the third quarter. They are benefiting from higher refinery margins following Beijing's loosening of price controls earlier this year. Domestic prices are now allowed to more closely follow international levels, but there are doubts over how far Beijing will go to shake up the state-owned firms, given the difficulty of making large-scale changes. But there is no doubt over what the effects could be. Competition will help consumers to get better service and prices. The oil price will be 10 percent cheaper if the oil sector were open to more players. China's retail oil price has risen nearly 40 percent since 2009. Zhang Tao, ICS4 CCTV, Shanghai. And to talk more about the development of China's private sector, Professor Liu Baocheng from the University of International Business and Economics joins us tonight. Professor, yes, welcome. Right. So China's private sector, right now employing the bulk of the country's labor force, its contribution to GDP and growth now surpassing its uh, state-owned enterprise peers. So developing the private sector definitely on top of the government's priority list. But it's not just about development per se, right? It's about innovation right. as well, like President exactly. Xi Jinping mentioned. Exactly. How do we make sure, where's that policy mix? to make sure that when private enterprises spring up here in China, they're born into the most innovative environment possible? I think now we need really to take a simplistic approach to a complex problem, mm. which is to further introduce the national treatment among different economic entities, including state-owned, foreign-owned, and private-owned. So uh, unless we have really an equal leveling field, there is no way 
that they can join in a free computation. And it, it is really the free computation that drives innovation. People in business do not in innovate for fun. They mm. innovate for economic gain. Right. And secondly, I think the uh, private business need uh, further guidance, training, and education. So I really advise that different uh, local government can set up a board that is uh, uh, the uh, combining professors, scholars, and business people uh, so that they can really provide strategic guidance to those newly startups. And thirdly, to step up also the intellectual property protection, because it is not only in the area of patent, but also business ideas, business models. So if they are not there uh, to be fully protected against piracy, you know, uh, the entrepreneurship and small business can be further mm -hmm. damaged uh, along that direction. So, uh, of course, you know, the uh, easier uh, access to finance can help them to boost innovation, yeah. particularly when they, uh, when they go to a certain, for example, in drug di uh, discovery, go to a clinical study stage. So that re requires a huge amount of capitalization. So after all, it is really the equal treatment and free competition that makes sense. So you're talking about an equal playing field here, and I feel there's a lot of challenges in terms of trying to overcome this barrier, right? Because you talked about difficulty in terms of accessing financing for small and medium-sized enterprises. Yeah. But also I want to touch upon the big vested state interests, right? The big yes. interest in state-owned enterprises. Right. How do private enterprises overcome that? Because I feel that's a huge deterrent to private enterprises coming to the market. That's right. So uh, it is. Right now, uh, very difficult for really for private business to compete on an equal footing with those state-owned companies. However, I think they can really uh, set up a platform where both can really specialize because private businesses are more responsive to market opportunities mm -hmm. and they can uh, join in the, uh, the peripheral uh, sectors uh, that is used to be uh, monopolized by big businesses. And uh, uh, in the meantime, the, uh, they are now encouraged through the policy in, in participation of the formerly monopolized areas. So I, I think now it's, there is ample opportunity, but the uh, uh, state-owned companies also need to refrain from really uh, delving into the uh, uh, sort of a dominant position in uh, many of the equity structures. So mm -hmm. that is something that private business are really afraid of. All right, and we talked about innovation, Professor. Just look at Guan Xin's report. Now, online companies are going to financing, right? So we're yeah, just beginning. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Right. Stay with us, Professor. More yes. questions for you in just a short while. Meanwhile, China's third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee are also likely to reveal the direction of state sector reforms and the shift in local government's financing powers, as currently local government spending rights and powers are not matching. And my colleague Cheng Lei sat down with Huang Yiping, professor at Peking University's China Center for Economic Research, and began by asking him what he's expecting from state sector reforms. Let's talk about the direction of China's ta tax reforms. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, there was a direction of trying to uh, give local governments more more power, mm -hmm. and now it looks like um, mm -hmm. our finance ministry is uh, is changing tack. Your yeah. thoughts? The latest move, I think, is uh, that the. The, the central government want to uh, take back some of the spending responsibilities, and uh, particular things like uh, pension uh, responsibilities for the police, for health care, for education, and so on. And to think about that, um, I think this is probably a good idea. It's a good idea for two reasons. Number one is for these functions, it probably is better to have a uniform standard for the whole country. Um, the second is, at this stage, we still have a big problem to solve at the local level. That is what we call the, the soft budget constraint for the local government, meaning they actually can borrow, do things, but they, they, they don't always account for, uh, accountable for these, uh, these borrowings and the responsibilities. That's why you saw the local borrowings rising very quickly. You also did a seminar where you were actually quite positive about some of the changes, the, uh, the rebalancing, mm. restructuring that's already happening in mm. the Chinese economy. Share with us some of the numbers. Growth rate is coming down now from above 8% and now it's 7.5%. I think gradually it will go down further. But the authorities remain very calm when the growth comes down. The key reason is because you're still seeing labor shortage problems. The government normally panic 
when you have unemployment problem. But now we have a labor shortage problem because the working age population was rising by 8 million a year 15 years ago. Last year it dropped by 3.5 million. So I think we're going to accept the slower growth just as a part of a natural process. But on the other hand, even the, the structure is already improving. Um, the current account surplus or trade surplus is already down to very low levels. So external sector rebalancing is already done. Surprisingly, people used to complain that our exchange rate is, is, is under, underestimated. They now say we're not a currency manipulator. No, it's very close to equilibrium. Now, at the upcoming plenary session, fiscal reforms can be expected as well. Let's bring back Professor Liu to get his take on this issue. So, Professor, over the yes. past three decades, China's economy has evolved so rapidly. Has China's tax regime, its tax structure, evolved with the country's growth? And what changes might we need to see in the country's tax system in order to better support the country's economic rebalancing efforts, you think? I think the, uh, before we uh, really decide how much and how the tax reform is going to be carried out, uh, we really need to further define the role of government, both at the central and also the local level. Mm. So what are they supposed to do and what are they not supposed to do? So uh, after really we streamline you know, the government function under the new uh, circumstance, we, uh, and the second homework is really we need to define the clear line between what the central government is supposed to do and what the local government is supposed mm. to do. And uh, otherwise. So, uh, and uh, after that, uh, the, I think the local government needs certain motivation to really to, uh, to protect the environment and to boost the local uh, productivity. But uh, uh, in the meantime, they are not really supposed to invest like a company and even to compete with public and uh, private firms on the same footing. So they really need to, to uh, promote a sort of stewardship towards the business uh, environment. And uh, uh, then the, uh, right now there is a uh, worrisome issue that uh, people speculate, well, when the central government is, start, uh, is really tightening the budget, well, will the local government be encouraged to explore uh, more the tax uh, resources in this way that can really be translated into more tax burden mm. to uh, businesses. So uh, I think the good news for me is that today I re received a message from our tax bureau that my company is now successfully uh, approved for, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the changes into uh, the uh, 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 revenue based and now into the uh, profit based right. so which is a uh, good news and now I think the uh, hopefully more businesses can really benefit from the uh, government uh, support instead of government intervention from the business to the VAT tax now. That's right. Okay. So right now what we're seeing and the reports and predictions we're hearing for the upcoming plenary session that's going to happen this weekend is possibly we're seeing a shift into more central governments taking on responsibilities versus local governments. If that actually happens, what might the fiscal balance sheet of the national government look like? Might we see tax hikes across the board in the nation then? Well, I do not think so because uh, uh, right now if we really wanted to see a he healthy and stable growth of the Chinese economy, uh, our central government has realized that uh, very clearly it is not really the government that is playing the instrumental role in uh, investing more into infrastructures, but rather to encourage more businesses to, uh, to get involved into the uh, contribution of real GDP growth. Mm. So uh, this way, I think now uh, the government is now uh, very clear that it's going to be more business friendly. So therefore, I could really see a more alleviation of tax burdens onto the business. And of course, the central government is going to tighten certain guidelines, particularly towards the people's livelihood and also towards the environment, so that local government can be further streamlined to cater mm. only to those parts that people really care, instead of uh, serving as a competitor to other business institutions. All right, some great insights tonight, Professor Liu. Many thanks for joining us. Yes. Professor Liu Baocheng from the University of International Business and Economics. All right, folks.